Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral radiology series. This video will be all about the types of radiographs that you can take and how to read them. So we can break down the types of x-rays that we can take into two big categories. So over on the left, we have our direct or intraoral images. And these are taken with the receptor inside the mouth. So x-ray photons are directly interacting with the receptor. Examples of these are the periapical, or PA, the bite wing, or BW, and the occlusal image. Over on the right, we have our indirect or extraoral images. And these are images that require a specialized screen placed outside the patient's mouth, which the x-rays contact before interacting with the film. So examples of extraoral images are panoramics or pans, cephalometrics or cephs, and then we'll also put in our 3D image called the cone beam computed tomography. We'll cover all of these different radiographs in this video. We're gonna start though with the periapical. So periapicals are used to capture the roots of the teeth, including their apices. And this enables you to look for any manifestations of pulpal or periodontal disease. The periapical radiolucency, which is a dark spot at the root apex, is a good sign of an endodontic condition, for example. They're, all, they're also used almost exclusively for detecting radiographic presence of caries in the anterior region. And notice how the periapicals are positioned vertically in the anterior and horizontally in the posterior. And this is so that they're in the, the most ideal and optimal position for capturing those root apices. So let's talk about some normal anatomy. We can show you what some of this will usually look like for a normal tooth. So we have our enamel layer on this premolar, we can see very clearly that transitions into the dentin layer, which is a little bit more radiolucent, not quite as radiopaque as the enamel. And then we have the pulp tissue, which is more radiolucent yet. Over on the molar here, we have a rather large amalgam restoration, and this metallic filling will attenuate almost the entire x-ray beam, which means that none of those x-ray photons are getting through to the receptor, so it remains a blank canvas, like we talked about in the last video. We also have, speaking of not normal anatomy, some interproximal caries. I might also argue that this looks like some occlusal caries over on this molar, but we'll talk more about caries detection a little bit later in the next video. We also have uh, this thin radiopaque line. This is called the lamina dura, and that's a dense border of the alveolar bone that the periodontal ligament attaches to. This is a sign of a healthy uh, periodontium. The th very thin radiolucent line that's hard to point to, it's right inside the lamina dura, that's the periodontal ligament space where the actual ligament resides. So that's just some of the normal things that we look at when we see an x-ray. All right, so the bite wing, by contrast, does not show root apices. It instead focuses more on the crowns and the bone height, the alveolar bone height. And bite wings are usually better for posterior caries detection especially between teeth and for checking bone levels, as well as calculus deposits. So we can see clearly our bone levels, and those are fairly accurate because the bite wing is taking these in a parallel direction. Periapical is coming more at a vertical angle, so bone levels aren't quite as reliable on the PAs. That's why we usually like to take these bite wings and rely more on that for reliable bone level reading. Also, you can see a little bit 
of radiopaque, that radiopaque spec is some calculus deposits. Now, the bite wings are usually exposed horizontally, but they can be vertical as well. All right, next we have our occlusal films, and these are taken with the receptor lying flat on the occlusal plane, and they should capture from canine to canine, and it provides a different angulation to shed some light on perhaps an alveolar bone fracture, maybe an impacted tooth, a missing tooth, or a supernumerary tooth. Like in this mandibular occlusal film, we can see this premolar that is completely impacted and crossing the midline, and you can get a really good view of it in this occlusal, from this uh, angulation, thanks to the occlusal film. Now, the nice thing about the occlusals is that they're generally easier for pediatric patients. They'll tolerate them a bit better because the receptor is less likely to pinch down uh, at their floor of their mouth or uh, by either the upper or lower lip. All right, so let's go to the extraoral images. And the panoramic x-rays spin around the patient's head hence the name panoramic, and they're incredibly useful for screening, for pathology of the jaws, and also locating third molars. So this is an excellent diagram for listing out the various landmarks for a pan. Now I won't go over all of these 21 numbers, but let's hit the highlights real quick. So whenever I look at a panoramic, I have a systematic way to approach it. And you can develop whatever method you want, but I recommend using the same approach every time. And it's good to start global and then go local. So the temptation is to immediately zoom in on the teeth first, but I start up here at the right condyle. I look for any irregularities, trace down the articular eminence, look at the maxillary sinus, the lateral wall, and then you come down the floor, look at the medial wall, go to the nasal cavity, and then you can go to the other condyle, look at the left, compare it to the patient's right side, trace that articular eminence, go through this sinus area, the nasal cavity, etc. So I usually start kind of looking at that part, and then I would go down to the right uh, gonial angle, look in here, this is probably one of the most common places for uh, pathology of the bone to manifest. Then I would trace the inferior border of the mandible, look for any, again, irregularities, any thinning or thickening, go to the other gonial angle, again, compare it to the other side, look symmetrically. And at this point, after we trace around all the teeth, then I would go to the teeth and I would first count all of them, see how many teeth there are, if there's anything missing, anything extra. Then you can look at the crowns, look at the bone levels, and then look at the roots of all the teeth. And after all of that, you have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Now, cephalometrics gather information on the patient's entire head. Ceph means head after all. And the lateral ceph is the most common cephalometric x-ray and gives you a side profile look at everything. And it's most used for determining the relationship of teeth and the jaws to one another and to the rest of the cranium. You can also superimpose two lateral ceph tracings on top of one another, usually on the anterior cranial base area because it's the most stable area, and that would be to compare a before and after look, either before and after orthodontic treatment, before and after surgical treatment, or changes during normal growth. And then we have the posterior anterior, or PA ceph, which gives you a front back view. It's not really used that much anymore since it's mostly been usurped by the cone beam, but it does or it was used for looking at transverse asymmetry because 
the transverse dimension is the one thing that's missing from the lateral Ceph view. But in the PA Ceph, we can clearly see this asymmetry of the mandible. And so that's really what this was historically used for. So we have the cone beam computed tomography image. The CBCT is an extremely valuable three-dimensional radiographic image. And we get three different views from it. We have the axial view, which gives you a top-bottom view, the sagittal, which is a side-to-side -side view, and the coronal, which is the front-to-back view. And we can physically scan through each of these views to look at hundreds of different slices through the patient's tissue. And so the software also provides a 3D volumetric render where you can twist this around, you can zoom in on certain areas of interest and see what's going on in a very clear 3D way, which is really cool. Implant planning is the most common use for CBCT imaging. You're able to check bone quality, the quantity of bone, how high and how wide a certain alveolus might, uh, alveolar ridge might be. You can look at where vital anatomy is, so where the inferior alveolar nerve is, where the lingual artery is, and then you can even make a template from a 3D printer to figure out where exactly we want to place this implant, where we can avoid any vital structures, for instance. Endodontics can use cone beams as well to look at things like root fracture, root resorption, and to better understand complex canal anatomy. Orthodontics uses CBCTs to look at tooth impaction, the exact location and orientation of an impacted tooth, and its relation to other tooth roots. TMJ uh, can look, you can look at things like the condylar head, the fossa, and the articular eminence. However, if you're looking at soft tissue, you need to have an MRI. Hard tissue is really the only thing that you're looking at if you're taking a CBCT zoomed in on the TMJ. And then, of course, pathology. So you can get a really good look at certain path pathological lesions that maybe might be obfuscated by a regular two-dimensional radiographic image. Now let's talk about some specialized views that can appear on the board exam. So the Waters view is the standard x-ray of choice for showing an anterior view of the paranasal sinuses and midface and orbits. So it basically frames everything really nicely around the cranial vault. So it's a PASF, but it's taken on an angle. And that angle is about 45 degrees to the orbitomedial line. And so you're going to have the patient's face lying against the film, and the x-ray source is going to come from behind the patient's head. So this is, again, the best film for a radiographic diagnosis of midfacial fractures, sinus infections, and lesions of the maxillary sinus because they're framed so nicely for you within that cranial vault. Town's view is another angled PASF of the skull, but it's coming from the opposite direction. This time the film is under the head and the source is from the front. This time it's directed uh, right at the condyles at about a 30 degree angle to the orbitomedial line. This one is the best film to visualize the condyles and the neck of the mandible, and that's because um, it eliminates the superimposition of the mastoid and zygoma over the condylar neck that you would often get in the straight PA Ceph projection, which makes interpretation of that region very, very difficult. The town's view, by angling that x-ray source, lets you get, the con get a better look at the condyle anatomy. The submento vertex view or submental vertical view is a base projection of the skull with the source below the mandible and the film above the head. So basically you lean your head all the way back and then the x-ray source comes in 
uh, under your chin. And this is the best x-ray for diagnosing basilar skull fractures, and it provides some information about the zygomatic arches and the mandible. So it can be used when you suspect a fracture of the zygomatic arch as well. All right, let's talk about two techniques for taking intraoral images now. So the first one we'll talk about that can come up on the board exam is the bisecting angle technique. And this is where the central ray of the x-ray beam is aimed perpendicular to the imaginary bisector between the long axis of the tooth and the long axis of the image receptor. So here we have drawn the long axis of the tooth, long axis of the image receptor, and this is that imaginary line that's bisecting those two other lines. And so if we're able to angle the primary ray of the x-ray beam perpendicular to this imaginary bisector, we have a very cool geometric phenomenon that happens. Because if the central ray is positioned in this way, you end up with two equal triangles. Both of those triangles that are formed are equal because they share the same bisecting line. And so this hypotenuse here and this hypotenuse here are gonna be exactly the same length. And because that's true, you're going to have, theoretically, the image on the film being equal to the length of the tooth. So both of those should be the same length. Now, however, the problem with this is that the x-ray image may still be distorted because the image is not a true reproduction of the object because there's still some angulation going on. You may still be getting some stretching or distortion of the actual true anatomy. And that's where the paralleling technique comes in. And so this is where the receptor is placed parallel to the long axis of the tooth. So this time, both the long axes of the tooth and the image receptor are parallel with each other. And the receptor, and I should say the source, is placed so that the central ray of the x-ray beam is aimed perpendicular to both of those axes, the tooth and the receptor. And so in this case, an XCP, or uh, which stands for extension cone paralleling device, basically just a film holder. It, film, it holds the film packet or digital sensor in place. One of those must be used in order to ensure that the position indicating device, that's this part here, is pointing at the right in the right direction and so that everything is lined up perfectly well because if anything is just slightly off here, you're going to get some distortion and it's gonna defeat the purpose of going through the effort of doing the paralleling technique. So if it's carried out properly, there's less distortion and you get an overall better image. But the one downside here is that the object to image distance, that OID, is increased. Look at how small it is for the bisecting angle technique it's a lot longer here because, well, especially in the upper arch, this part, that palatal, that palatal vault area where it's sloping is going to get in the way of the receptor. So you have to push that receptor to where, to where the palatal vault is the highest, and so you're going to have some inherent distance there. So what does that mean? Well, if that object image distance is increased, that means the image is going to be a bit more magnified but that's okay. So in the last video, we talked about troubleshooting some problems specifically with film, but now since we've gone over those imaging techniques, let's talk about some of the other common errors that we can get more so with digital imaging. So elongation is the most common error in radiology, and it can be due to an angulation error or if the receptor is being bent while the image is captured. And remember, a radiograph is a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object. So some distortion and overlapping is to be expected, 
but these all are examples of operator errors that can be avoided. The cone cut, oh, and this is an example of elongation. You can see how long these roots are, and likely that film was, or the digital receptor was being bent while the image was taken. A cone cut, which is seen over here, means that the x-ray beam and the receptor were not lined up properly. Either the XCP device that a film holder wasn't being used or just things weren't lined up for some reason. And so the actual x-ray beam was probably shooting more up in this direction. And so all this part of the receptor was, was just completely missed and not exposed. And so it remained a blank canvas. So with a circular collimator, you're going to see something like this, where the line is rounded. If you used a rectangular collimator, you'd have a straight edge that's being cut off. Again, we can have underexposed, which appears like a grainy image. It's too light, and that's, that could be due to any number of wrong settings that we talked about in the second video. The exposure time's too short. Uh, low MA, low KVP, or the distance is too far. Then we can have the opposite where the image is overexposed. Again, wrong settings. The exposure time could be too long, a high MA, a high KVP, etc. You can also have a double exposure, and this is where two images are exposed on the same PSP plate. So that's before the PSP plate was red and before it was cleared. So it had already had an image stored on it, and then you exposed another image on top of that. So you can kind of see where these interproximal contact areas are being overlapped on this new fresh image. And so this is just non -di not diagnostic and would have to be cleared and retaken. Now some errors exclusive to panoramics. And so motion is most often seen in a panoramic because it's spinning around the patient's head for several seconds and if they're swallowing or uh, kind of physically moving around shaking their head a little bit you could have some motion errors and so lines that should be sharp like the inferior border of the mandible could appear wavy and irregular and that's a pretty good sign that they were swallowing while this thing was uh, spinning around also for panoramics, if the chin is tilted too far down, the occlusal plane shows an excessive upward curve, what I call a big smile. And if the chin is tilted too far up, you can see a flat or even a reverse occlusal plane, so it looks more like a frown. And to remember this and keep these two straight, just look at yourself smiling in the mirror. And if you tilt your chin up, and then down, you'll see what I'm talking about, how you kind of create a, a big smile or a frown, because again, this is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. And last, but certainly not least, we have ghosting. And no, I'm not talking about online dating. I'm talking about image detector lag. And this is something, again, exclusive to panoramics, where a radiopaque artifact gets projected to the other side of the image and can obfuscate the anatomy. So things like jewelry, glasses, dentures with metal in them, any of that can cause this ghosting effect. And so this pan is actually from one of my patients and it's the first time I've ever seen this, but they left not only their earrings in place, but also an AirPod in their left ear. So you can see how these, image, these images get ghosted over to the other side. So here are the three earrings. Here's the AirPod. And then they also had an earring on their right side that got ghosted, looks like, up here. And so a ghosted image will be uh, translated to the other side. It'll be slightly higher up, and it'll also be magnified and enlarged. And so these things can really block some of the anatomy that you want to look at. Luckily, 
we were looking for the third molars here, but this can certainly be a problem, especially if they have something intraoral or close to their oral cavity, where it could ghost in an unfortunate location. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.